Okay, thank you, Dean. Thanks for introductions. And hello, everyone. Today is my great pleasure to introduce our project. Uh, I'm Ruo Bing Han. I'm the second year PhD student in Georgia Institute of Technology. So our project's name is Kupal, and this is why it names Kupal, but I think it's so unclear. So in a war, So in a world, we, can, we build a framework that can execute CUDA on non-NVIDIA device. So this is what our projects aimed for. And so for motivations, we know for the software side, like cryptocurrencies, um, computer versions, porting instruction predictions, and computer graphics like ray tracings, all those applications require to be executed on GPU architectures to achieve high peak performance. And due to the well-organized documents and tutorials, uh, CUDA became one of the most popular choice for software developers. But however, let's look at the hardware size, like for those most powerful computing systems, like Fukaku and Frontiers, uh, none of them contains of NVIDIA device, so they cannot execute in CUDA. And also we know for MacBook Pro, and also we have some customized chips that based on like RISC five. Although all of them contains have really really high performance, can be comparable with NVIDIA device, but they can just not executing CUDA programs because it is there is some window lock for the CUDA. Okay. Oh, it works. <laughs> I should do this way. Oh, yeah, it makes sense. It's there. So, you know, well, if CUDA can be executed on non NVIDIA device, so the other hardware vendors can benefit from the CUDA ecosystem because there are so many software applications that are especially right for CUDA. And also, we know NVIDIA device is only a small part for a heterogeneous systems. And so, if it be executed on CUDA or on NVIDIA device, at that time, the rest part of the heterogeneous systems are all idle. So if we can support executing CUDA on other device, we can allow single kernel multiple device executions. And further, if we uh, work on a data centers uh, like warehouse, and there is so many idle CPU device. So if we can utilize those device, maybe we can further lower the total cost of the ownership. So for the background information, let's look at the pipeline for how CUDA be compiled to NVIDIA device. So first we have CUDA source code and it contains of host code and kernel code. And if we're using clone front end, it will compile to LVMR and NVVMR separate, separately. And with uh, NVPTX code chain to chain, the NVVMR will be compiled to PTX assembly. And after that, we can compile it and further link them together. And we can generate five binaries, which can be executed on NVIDIA device systems. So there is some related work that's supposed to execute in CUDA on non-NVIDIA device. So it can be regarded as two class. Uh, the first class is relies on source to source translators, like Intel proposed DPCT to to convert CUDA to DPC++, which can be executed on Intel CPU or Intel GPU. And also AMD proposed HIP5 to convert CUDA to HIP, which can be executed on AMD GPUs. Uh, all those translators are always pretty lightweight because they are based on regular expressions and also AIST analyzers. So, and also both the input and output of those translators are human readable source code. So that is easy to maintain. But there is a um, short fallback is first, if we rely on another high level language, so we know there are so many unusual ca use cases for high level languages. Like for C++, there is Marcos template. And so for those translators, as I said, they most based on regular expressions. So regular expressions can hardly handle all those unusual cases. 
So for those projects, the human debugging are always required for the translated code. And another thing is uh, we know if we want to target our target language, uh, there is some API difference between the source language CUDA and the target language. For example, for DPC++, uh, it using exceptions to raise error. But we know for CUDA, it will using error code as a return value to return error for a kernel launch. So those differences also bring some challenges for those translators. And there is another kind of projects using reverse engineering like Oslot. So they rely on PTX assembly to convert. So the input uh, is a binary PTX assembly and it do some reverse engineering to convert it back to control flow graph. Oh, yeah, okay. Control flow graph and other meta informations are using those informations to regenerate binary code for other hardware vendors. And this is a pro great project, but there is some challenges. First is reverse engineering itself is always painful. And also if we want to rely on CUDA proprietary toolchains, like if we want to generate PTX assembly, uh, it is unavoidable, but it is not open source. So for conclusions, what we want is first, we want to get rid of manual modifications for the translated code, which can be executed on other hardware uh, directly. And also we want to have some scalability to new CUDA updates so that we can hardly rely on any, any other target language. And other is we want to only want to rely on open source tool chains. So based on those observations, we propose our solutions. So instead of using source code or PTS assembly, uh, we do our translators from translations from our VM and VVM IR level. So the good thing is the whole tool chains is open source because we minimum focus on based on clone front end. And also because um, our VMR is quite like a low level language, so that we don't need to handle those complicated C++ use cases. And another thing is in our framework, we don't rely on any other target language or third party libraries, uh, third party languages. So if we want to update for new CUDA features, we only need to update the framework itself but doesn't need to update a target language and also update the translators to that language. So instead of translating CUDA to another portable language, we make CUDA itself a portable language. So this is the insight of our project. So our framework, it contains of two parts. First is the runtime part. Uh, actually, it just contains of some runtime libraries that implement those CUDA built-in functions or CUDA APIs for a non-NVIDIA device. And another part is completion part. And this part is quite necessary if you want to execute in CUDA on non-GPU architectures. And I will show it later. So for runtime, uh, it contains of some libraries. Uh, we can just do some tricky things to change the linking path during code generations. So as you can see, if we change the linking path to link to different libraries, the unmodified CUDA source code can be executed on both NVIDIA device and CPU device. It only depends on which libraries you are linking with. So to support a new CUDA features, uh, in most case for a new CUDA API, uh, the developers only need to implement these new APIs in those library and the linker itself can automatically link this to the original CUDA code. So that is lightweight to update a new CUDA feature in our project. And another critical part is completion part. So let's have a case study if we want to execute in CUDA on CPU device. So we know CUDA uh, is designed for GPU, which is single mo program multiple data designed for throughput. But for CPUs, it is designed for latencies, so it's multiple program, multiple data. 
So here is a really simple case for vector add. Uh, as you can see, there are 64 blocks, and each block contains about 1,000 threads. So in total, there are 64,000 CUDA threads in this vector add. So definitely, if we want to use a CPU thread to emulate a GPU thread, uh, we can now handle such a great amount of CPU threads. And another thing is for the workload in each thread, uh, it's pretty lightweight, so it's not friendly for MPMD architectures. So there are some uh, researchers propose some transformations. They using a single layer for loop to wrap a whole workload within a CUDA block into a single CPU functions. So that after these mappings, uh, we only require 64 CPU threads, the same number as the GPU block. And for each thread, the workload is uh, comparable heavier, so that it's much more friendly for CPU architectures. So this is called like SPMD to MPMD transformations. And so for this kind of transformations, it contains of two parts. First is we have to analyze to find the parallel regions. So you can imagine parallel regions as the code before the barrier and after the barriers. So as you can see in this in, uh, functions, uh, there is statement A and statement B, and there is a barrier between them. So we need to wrap statement A into a for loop and wrap a statement B in another for loop. So this is the next step. So after we know those parallel regions, we wrap with each of those regions with a single layer for loops. So all those are related work. And there are some limitations for those, limit, for those limit related works. So there is an assumption that for each barrier, all the thread within a block will reach these barriers, or none of the thread will reach these barriers. So this is always true for earliest CUDA versions, but we know for the latest CUDA or after CUDA 10, there is some warp shuffle functions. Like in here, uh, we do a warp shuffle, shuffle down in this warp. So for those warp shuffle instructions, it contains of implicit warp level barriers. So each thread in this warp has to do synchronizations between and after these instructions. So this is a warp level barriers. And as you can see from the second lines, the only the first warp in this GPU block will reach the if body. In other words, the warp level barrier will only be reached by the first warp in the block, now for the whole thread in the block. So in that case, the assumption doesn't be satisfied anymore. So based on those observations, uh, we propose our solutions so instead of using a single layer for loop, we're using a nested for loop. So that for the outer loop is a interwarp loops. So it will go through the whole warp within a GPU block. And for the inner loop is interwarp loop. It will go through all the threads within a warp. So that with nested for loop, we can have hierarchical parallel regions so that we can support those warp level shuffles because it's requires warp level barriers. So it is another kind of contributions in our work. So for evaluations, first we evaluate the hardware coverage. So because we based on LVM, so after we translate CUDA to LVM and do some transformations, we will using clone, opt, or other things to directly generate binary code. So for CPU backend, we have evaluated on ICD6, ARM, and RISC-V and it can all be spared without much human effort. And also for software coverage, as I said, we doesn't require any manual modifications, and we also open to new CUDA features. So that compared with Intel solutions and AMD solutions, uh, we compare on Rodinia benchmark, which is a classical HPC benchmark, and also Crystal, which is database benchmark, implement some SQL operations, and we can achieve the highest performance on both those benchmarks. And also we compare the performance because most time we rely on some LVM O3 optimizations, lock free queue, and we also propose some runtime optimizations for lightweight kernels. 
so that we can achieve higher performance compared to uh, ARM, RISC V, and S86 with those framework. And there is some unsolved problems. So most is for performance. So let's look at the roof line models. For the green curve and the green dot, you can see all those dots are pretty close than those green curves, which, which means it achieves the peak performance in those programs. And however, after translated for those red and blue, blue dot, they are much below the curves, which means it doesn't, it's much below the peak performance. And in other words, most times the ALU or the computer, unit, computer units are idle because they are waiting for the memory. So this is a case. So this is quite a classical GPU memory access patterns. So for each iteration, uh, GP, uh, each GPU thread will execute an array element with a constant interval because there is lo some lock steps so that for the threads within a warp, they can access the contiguous memories. But after translated to CPUs, uh, the memory access patterns become much bad, and most times it results cache miss, so that the latency is pretty high, so that we cannot achieve the peak performance. So to solve those problems, maybe we need to rely on polyhedral models or do some memory access patterns reordering. So this is as a open source, uh, as a future work. And another thing is we know the peak performance for a GPU uh, is not in the same level with the peak performance of a single CPU. But in the data centers, there are so many idle CPUs. So if we can utilize those CPUs and achieve the comparable performance, uh, maybe we can further lower the total cost of ownership about the data center maintainers. Uh, yeah, so that's for all. And Kupal is an open source project released on GitHub under Apache license. And we will sincerely appreciate any kind of feedback and, and contribute solutions. Uh, yeah, thanks for your time, and I'm glad to take any questions. So, so thank you, Lobin, for the talk. So anyone has questions, please come to the mic in both sides. Uh, so most of our evaluations are done on the single CPUs, or they have 16 four cores, or no more. So, but one of on ongoing projects is we want to migrate with MPI or OpenMP so that they can execute on warehouse levels with more CPUs. And for those evaluations, most applications only support on a single machines, so not that scalable. So scalable is a um, really critical thing we need to solve for our project. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, another thing is I'm on the job market for next year's summer internship. So if you have any positions you think is suitable, uh, please contact me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Davi, for the talk.